just give it about a minute or so. Um, We have made for them. Set to go. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, we have a very packed agenda, so I'm going to go ahead and get started now that we have quorum. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Continuum of Care board meeting. Let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. My name is Tamara Wright, and I'm with Community Solutions, and I'm the COC board chair. Um, I will now have Sarah commence with a roll call of each board member and ask you to introduce yourself and your organization. Uh, first one, Ryan Balch. Uh, here, uh, Ryan, City of Chandler. Perfect. Eric Cole. Hi, Eric Cole. Happy New Year. All right. Elizabeth DeCosta. Uh, we'll call uh, Marshall Franklin. Happy New Year, everyone present, City of Phoenix. Hey, Marshall. Tad Gary. Happy New Year, everyone. This is Tad Gary from Mercy Care. Hi there, Samantha Jackson. I am present. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bruce Liggett. Bruce Liggett, Maricopa County. Happy New Year. Service. Hi, Joan Service with the Housing Coalition. Wonderful. Hi, Charles Sullivan. Uh, Jackie Taylor. Hi, I couldn't unmute myself. Some of you may be going, yes. Um, Happy New Year, everybody. Good to be with you. Jackie Taylor, Save the Family. Happy New Year. And last, but certainly not least, Tamara Wright. I am here. This is Tamara, Community Solutions. Perfect. Okay, so, yeah. I think Liz joined. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I look like Liz, uh, like Elizabeth joined right after uh, she was called for roll call. Hello, yes, thank you, Elizabeth DeCosta with Community Bridges. Thank you, Liz. And then uh, maybe one more time, uh, Charles Sullivan, are you there? Okay, we've got everybody else. Thank you so much. Go ahead, uh, take it away, Tamara. Thank you so much. Um, in addition, we have guest presenters today. When I call your name, please introduce yourself and your organization. Dr. Keith Bentel, is that correct? Hi, it's uh, Bentley. Um, I'm Keith Bentley. I'm an associate research professor at the Southwest Institute for Research on Women, which is located at the University of Arizona. Happy New Year, everyone. Awesome, thank you, welcome. And we also have CJ Hager. Hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Yes, you are. Apologies. I'm finding the buttons on the Zoom are now suddenly challenging for me. So yes, CJ Eisenbarth Hager. I'm the Director of Healthy Communities for Vitalist Health Foundation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Welcome, both of you. Um, also joining us today are Steve Dudasik, Sarah Kent, Tina Lopez, Brandy Mead, Julie Montoya, Amy St. Peter from MAG. Uh, did I miss anyone from MAG? Okay. Yes, yeah, Sapna Gupta from MAG. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome, Sapna. Um, for all participants, please mute your phone or computer when not speaking. And please do not put your phone on hold as sometimes this puts music into the conference call. And for all participants, we ask that you please identify yourself when speaking. We will be reminding people to do that throughout the meeting as we have been advised. This is very important for open meeting law. And one final housekeeping item, all votes will be roll call votes. And I will call the roll after a motion is made. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item, we have call to the audience. So please note that members of the public were given an opportunity to submit written comments relating to this meeting to azmag.gov forward slash comment within one hour of the posted start time for the meeting. Were there any comments received, Sarah? Uh, yes, Tamara, there were. Um, one second, please. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, and 
Um, there were actually two comments received. Okay. Um, additionally, members of the public are now given the opportunity to ask to join the Zoom link to make verbal comment. And please note that verbal comments are limited to three minutes. Um, we have received, um, a re if we have received a request to comment on an update to the Human Services Campus, request to add shelter beds, and Sarah will read the comment now. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Madam Chairwoman and members of the COC. Uh, board. My name is Sarah Kent and I'll be res uh, reading the uh, public comment from the Human Services Campus. Okay, so this is an update on Human Services Campus request uh, to add shelter beds. This week on January 7th, the Planning Commission is once again scheduled to hear our request. Our first hearing at the Planning Commission was on November 6th. And we encountered not one, but two uh, continuances effectively delaying our case for two months. While these were frustrating setbacks, we used our time to conduct additional, uh, addition, conduct additional, um, additional feedback to community outreach and gather additional community support. Since, since our first continuance, we have one received a, uh, unanimous support from the Phoenix Commission on Human Relations. Number two, learned that 2020 was exceptionally deadly for people experiencing homelessness with over 500 uh, folks passing away in the first nine months alone. Um, number three, uh, attended two additional community meetings at the request of council member uh, Noah Kowski, uh, where we provided information about um, this, uh, the stipend related to our request. Number four, hosted six additional meetings with our immediate neighbor, members of the Mad Madison Pioneer Coalition. Number five listed, attended a meeting with representatives from uh, Maricopa County and the City of Phoenix and Madison Pioneer Coalition to seek solutions to some of the concerns about trash and other public health issues. And last six, uh, collected a significant number of petition signatures, uh, bringing our total to over 21,000 signatures. Uh, people can help by emailing uh, pdd.planningcomm at phoenix.gov, uh, stating your support for agenda number 19. Uh, please reach out to Amy uh, Schwabenlinder uh, for more details. Thank you so much. And that concludes the, um, the written comment. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have also received one request for a written comment on agenda item eight from Jennifer Dandremont from the Native American Connections. So when item eight is presented, Sarah will read your written comments on that item. Uh, we will now move on to the next agenda item, which is approval of the meeting minutes. Was it really September 28th? That can't be right. I'm so sorry, that is not right. <laughs> um, the meeting, uh, the agenda, the meeting minutes from last month. <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve um, the meeting minutes and approval of the consent agenda? So moved, this is Tad. Hi Tad, thank you so much. I can second Samantha Jackson. All right, thank you. Um, as a reminder, um, board members may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda if there's a need for discussion, but since we've had a motion and you guys are familiar with that, I'm, I'm assuming we don't need that. So hearing none, um, approval of the consent items, I will toss it over to Sarah who will proceed with a roll call vote. And please indicate clearly how you choose to motion stating yay or nay after your name is called, Sarah. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Ryan Balch. Yay. Eric Cole. Aye. Elizabeth Tacosta. Aye. Marshall Franklin. Aye. Tad Gary. Aye. Samantha Jackson. Aye. Bruce Liggett. Aye. Joan Service. Aye. Thank you. And uh, Charles Sullivan. Uh, Jackie Taylor? Aye. Okay. And Tamara Wright? Aye. Okay. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And we're going to move on to item number four, which is forecasting homelessness. And Dr. Keith Benatelli, hopefully I said that correctly, uh, is an associate research professor at the Southwest Institute for Research on Women at the University of Arizona and will provide an overview of various indicators of housing insecurity and potential uh, resulting increases in homelessness in Arizona. Thank you so much. Um, I am trying to share my screen. Okay, I can. Excellent. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again, or good afternoon, Jish. Uh, I am, just want to start by expressing my appreciation for speaking to you and uh, start with an apology uh, to say that forecasting homelessness right now uh, is literally impossible for reasons that uh, I think are obvious to most of us, uh, but I'll speak through them quickly. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is give you a very rough sense of some of the indicators that I'm paying attention to to get a sense of the scope of the problem uh, and the potential scope of what we may uh, be likely to see if and when the eviction moratorium uh, eventually expires. So uh, in July of this year, uh, me and a colleague at Xero put out a uh, policy brief estimating the likely increases in homelessness in Arizona based on different levels of unemployment. Uh, so we put together a model that I won't go into the details of where we said that if there was a peak unemployment rate of 15% during the current recession, we'd expect to see a 16% increase in the rate of homelessness. Uh, that would translate into uh, uh, roughly 13,000 folks uh, homeless in the state of Arizona relative to a roughly 11,000 folks based on the street count uh, from January 2020. And, uh, and if we hit a 20% unemployment rate, uh, we'd expect to see about a 29% increase in the, in the rate of homelessness, uh, representing about 14,000 folks becoming homeless uh, relative to the 11,000 in January of 2020. So I don't even like to show these numbers to people anymore, uh, because as I said a moment ago, uh, the assumptions this model is based on are not real anymore uh, for multiple reasons. And the two big categories here are that uh, the progression of the economy and this, cur this current recession is extremely different from historic the, the historical data that this model is based on. Uh, and secondarily, the multiple rounds of assistance coming through uh, the CARES Act and the forthcoming relief assistance bill uh, will make massive differences in terms of how much uh, financial strain from the recession actually translates into uh, homelessness in practice. On the first bit about the difference of this recession, um, many of you are probably familiar with this, but it, it, it cannot be emphasized enough uh, how uniquely deep and extreme this recession is as compared to prior recessions. So this is the progression of job recovery uh, in all recessions going back to 1948. And as of November of uh, 2020, we had not yet recovered uh, the, the number of jobs lost at the lowest ebb of the Great Recession. So we are very, very far uh, from a full recovery. and the, economic recovery has been slowing uh, in recent months at the national level, which is uh, terrible news and suggests that we have may have many, many years of slow recovery uh, to recover these uh, lost jobs. Secondarily, normally recessions have these rather smooth trajectories. Uh, this is Arizona unemployment. Uh, the jaggedness and the height of these unemployment levels are also uh, historically unique. Uh, or and something we haven't seen uh, in generations. And we are still at 8%, uh, which is a very, very high unemployment level. Okay, so uh, that's bad news. And we're trying to get a sense of how much this financial strain is likely to translate into actual homelessness. So one of the indicators that we, we and many other folks are relying on are the census household pulse surveys uh, that are coming out every two weeks. The most recent survey that was released and actually potentially the last survey, I hope the census extends this program, but it's unclear if that's gonna happen. Uh, the most recent survey was for mid-December, but those data are not, not, yet, uh, not yet released. So the most recent data we have covers late November, early December, in which 19% of Arizona renters said they were not current on their rent. So that's an enormous share of the renter population uh, not being current. I also just wanna mention though, that we do know that many folks who report not being current in the beginning of months are often able to pay the rent. 
uh, by the middle or end of the month. So this number is high. This number was also high, but this number fell by 10 percentage points uh, by mid-November. Uh, so we potentially could see some large decrease in this in the next wave, which we'll know hopefully this week. Homeowners uh, in Arizona reporting not being current on their mortgage payments uh, increased to 11% in early December. Um, but I'll say very quickly, uh, parenthetically, that I'm not that worried about this population of folks. Uh, of these individuals, they then ask them, how likely is it that you expect to experience a foreclosure in the next two months? And almost nobody thinks it's very likely that they're going to experience a foreclosure. So I think a lot of these folks are, are middling to upper income and are able to kind of negotiate this situation. And I expect that with uh, increased unemployment benefits and other assistance that will re be reaching these households, uh, that many of these households will be able to mitigate this strain. Uh, not all of them, and that's a concern, but that this is not the top of my list of things that I'm anxious about. Okay, going back to renters. Uh, rent, renters were then asked about their confidence and their ability to pay next month's rent. So the share of folks that have slight or no confidence in their ability to pay next month's rent has been trending slightly upward over the last few months. And in the most recent survey wave, we had about 28% uh, of Arizona renters that said they had slight or no confidence in their ability to pay next month's rent. So this is indicating, again, a really enormous amount of strain amongst these households. Of those households that said they were not current, this 19% that said they were not current in early December, they're then asked how likely they think it is that they'll experience an eviction in the next two months. So we can see here that between these two survey rates, we had a very substantial increase in those who said it was very likely that they'd experience an eviction. And in early December, 18% said it was very likely and another 30% said it was somewhat likely. Now, what it means to say that you're somewhat likely to experience an eviction is extremely ambiguous and mushy. This is to some extent capturing people's anxiety about their financial situations. But this does suggest to me that a big chunk of folks, right? So this is 20% of this 19% think that they're in a very dire economic situation. Okay, so let's turn to a, a, another tool that has used the same data to try to project forward. What are, what are we likely to see in terms of housing displacement and potential evictions. Uh, you may have heard of this model. It's gotten a lot of reporting. Uh, there's been a lot of reporting on this from Stout Rhesus Ross to the investment and advisory firm. And they built this model using the, the census data to estimate total rental shortfalls and to estimate the number of households likely to experience a housing disruption. Now, uh, they stopped updating this model uh, as of mid-November. And the reason for that is they said, look, there's all this assistance coming uh, now that we know this bill is likely to pass and that will dramatically change our estimates, right? So I wanna be really clear here that these estimates do not take into account the, uh, you, you know, the assuredly ameliorative effect of coming assistance. But it does give us a sense of the scope of strain that will need to be dealt with uh, by coming assistance. So they give a wide range of estimates uh, based on those that express only no confidence in their abilities to pay next month's rent, all the way up to those who say no slight or only moderate confidence. They, they take a portion of these folks as well. So these are these three different estimates. And again, this is in the absence of additional stimulus or rental assistance, what we'd be likely to see. So just focusing on these second two, last two rows, uh, we see they estimate the number of households in Arizona likely to experience a housing disruption or a, an eviction uh, in January is 21,000 uh, all the way up to potentially 88,000 households. And the total rental debt shortfall statewide, they estimate ranges from 123 to 406 million. Now, I think these estimates are too high based on other data that I'm looking at. So I've been focusing on this range, which feels much more realistic to me. So this still is 21,000 to 77,000 households at a rental debt range that at 123 million with what's been allocated already and what's coming, this is a very manageable problem. However, if we're at the higher end of this range and 365 million, then we're in a situation where I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks are not gonna be, uh, a lot of strain is not gonna be mitigated by even existing allocations. So where we are in this range really matters and we have a really hard time figuring out uh, based on existing data where we are, unfortunately. So I'm just going to take the midpoints of these two ranges and I'm going to walk through just a simple, uh, hype, some hypotheticals here 
So I'm going to start with the best case scenario, the most conservative estimate. So if we take this 27,000 folks who say they have no confidence in their ability to pay next month's mortgage, uh, next month's rent, I'm sorry, uh, let's say only 40% of those folks actually become displaced. That's about 11,000 households, about 30,000 people. And now we have 30,000 people who are displaced. We also know that all of those people are not going to become homeless. The majority will not. Uh, but survey data has suggested, at least in major metro areas, that about 25% of folks in homeless shelters are there because of evictions. So if we take that number and we say, let's take 25% of those 30,000 folks, that's about 7,000 people. And now let's say even better, only 10% of those folks become homeless. That's about 3,000 people. So these are large numbers and there are large increases in the statewide homeless population, uh, but they're not unmanageable, uh, especially with the amount of assistance that's coming in my opinion. If we're in this world uh, and a lot of folks fall through the cracks, uh, we could still see a, what I would call a significant rise in homelessness. Uh, but again, not something that's overwhelming our systems that's, that's unmanageable in practice. Okay. Now let's go to the most uh, least conservative line here. Uh, so this is more folks uh, in trouble, a larger fraction of them become displaced here about 42,000 households. That's about 100,000 people statewide. And if only 25% of them become homeless, that's 27,000 individuals. So even taking this number, this would represent a tripling of the statewide homeless population. But let's say we mitigate two thirds of this, right? With existing funds or with coming, coming funding. Even if we mitigate two thirds of this strain, that still would represent a doubling of the statewide homeless population. So again, this is like incredibly hard to do uh, in terms of giving people solid numbers, but where we are in these ranges and how these things play out in practice will really affect uh, how many folks are falling through the cracks at the end of the day. So it could be manageable. And I think it could also be uh, kind of alarming and overwhelming our existing capacity. That's terrible that that's the range that I'm suggesting to you as an academic expert, uh, but this is what uh, I think the range of possibility is. And what I've been encouraging people to do uh, in, in these talks is to just to think in terms of public policy planning about the range here and developing at the minimum a plan for a situation where there's a larger than expected surge in homeless individuals, again, when the eviction moratorium expires. The good thing is that every time I've been doing this presentation in the past, we've had these looming deadlines. At least we know now uh, that we're going to the end of January. And I think many of us have some hope and confidence that the Biden administration is very likely to extend the moratorium, all of which would enormously help with the sort of temporal crush in terms of spacing this out and spacing out evictions over time. Uh, but there is gonna be an end at some point uh, to the eviction moratoriums. And that's this is the big question is how many of these folks are still gonna be struggling when we get to that point. That depends on the progression of the pandemic. It depends on the pro progression of the economic recovery. And it also depends on whether or not there's additional funding coming from Congress all of which are big question marks at this point. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm running out of time. This slide, which I will not walk through, uh, is just using other data to say that this range from Stout, Rhesus, and Ross does not seem outrageously high to me looking at other indicators. So if we take this data from mid-November to be consistent with the Stout, Rhesus, Ross estimates, uh, about 36% of renters uh, reported that they thought it was, uh, sorry, renters who were not current reported that it was either somewhat likely or likely they'd be evicted in the next two months. That's about 47,000 households in Arizona, which again is comfortably within this range and on the higher end of this range. So that's making me feel again that this range is not, is not absurdly overinflated. This is only looking at data on renters and there may be a fraction of homeowners that also experience some strain that could add to uh, some of the difficulties here. Uh, there is industry data that suggests that things are not as bad as I'm suggesting here and others are suggesting. Um, I will talk about this in Q&A if you want about why I am not comforted by these numbers, these industry data. Uh, basically, I'll just say very quickly, the industry data includes the positive impacts of rental assistance that has been distributed in recent months. And secondarily, that the survey data they're using dramatically overrepresents highly professionalized uh, apartment complexes where you need a credit check to, to be living there, where the people are already screened. And so there's an overrepresentation of middle class and upper class renters uh, within the, the, the industry data that people are using to suggest that uh, lack of uh, people not making their rent is not as bad as others are suggesting. The thing I really want to uh, end on and emphasize to you all 
and I'm going to rush through these because I don't want to go over. Uh, basically, survey data is suggesting that very low income families have been maxing out all of their financial resources to make the rent. They are cutting into their food budgets, they're putting rent on their credit cards, they're spending down their savings, and they're borrowing money from friends and family. This has been going on for month after month after month, and I think that many of these low income families are going to find them in it, themselves in an extraordinarily dire financial situation where they've already tapped out their networks uh, and had, have already done that quite a while back. We see this in the increases in food insecurity, right? This is pre-pandemic, after currently in the pandemic, food insecurity amongst very low-income households who are cutting into their food budgets uh, to make their rent in some cases. There's a very high concentration of financial vulnerability among uh, people of color. Uh, one third of black households had not paid their rent in mid-November. About 18% of Latinx households had not paid their rent and households reporting that they are finding it very difficult to reach uh, pay usual expenses uh, is also very high amongst these uh, communities of color. The recovery, as you may have be maybe aware, has been very dis disparate along racial lines with people of color and especially African-American households recovering at a dramatically slower rate from a much larger decrease uh, in employment. And last, we have this K-shaped recovery phenomenon which is that unlike previous recessions, there has been a dramatically different negative financial impact on very low income households, and they have very weakly recovered. This gap is insane. This is incredibly large and very unusual relative to normal recessions. Okay, so again, this is really saying that these low income households are getting hit extraordinarily hard. We see this in the Arizona numbers on households experiencing a loss of income, highly concentrated amongst low income households, the ones that have experienced a loss of income. And we see this in not being current, and we see this in people that are reporting difficulties in paying their rent. The very low income households are experiencing extraordinary amounts of financial strain. So I just want to end by saying, you know, when I walk through this most conservative uh, uh, line here, so let's imagine only these really hardcore households, 27,000 households that are really poor are really struggling. Even if after all this new assistance gets distributed, only 40% of those households are displaced. This feels like a very realistic number to me as a very low bar estimate. That's 30,000 people. Now, if this 30,000 people, if a third of them are disproportionately representing those very low income households that have no, nothing left to mitigate this situation, and a third of them become homeless, that again represents nearly a doubling of the statewide homeless population. So if I am correct that these very low income households are gonna be overrepresented amongst this population, unable to mitigate this strain and this disruption, then we could still see very, very large increases in homelessness, even in the best case scenario. If we're in the worst case scenario or the higher end estimate of strain, then again, we could even see larger numbers. So I am still very, very concerned that because of the time delays here and the, and the, the time, it's still gonna take a little while for this funding to get allocated and, and programmatically useful to folks that we have a gap. And secondarily that given the duration of time that this is gonna to continue to go on for, we may see many, many households fall through the gap. So my main recommendation is to target assistance to communities of color and low income households. And if possible to do aggressive outreach to these uh, households and communities to get the now existing funds, which thank God we have, uh, to these households that are experiencing the most strain. So I, I apologize about going over a little bit and I will end it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Keith Benatelli. That was very sobering and <laughs> uh, welcome back everybody. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board for Dr. Benatelli? Um. That was an amazing presentation. And we talked at several board meetings before about just this kind of data with the ranges of options. So thank you so much. Um, being a county guy, I'm wondering, can you run that data for a county, specifically Maricopa? So I, I've been doing county level estimates for Pima County. Uh, the problem is that, uh, you know, you're basically just scaling statewide data to the county population. Uh, I, I was able to make initially earlier in the recession some adjustments for the differences in the regional economies. Uh, it can be done. I just, I'm just saying that it, it, it's, a, it's a very rough approximation. Uh, my concern is that, again, because the recession is so disproportionately impacting very low-income communities. So I'm, I'm thinking, for example, that 
uh, some native communities, for example, and some very specific low income areas of the state are really getting slammed and may not fall within the bounds of Maricopa or Pima. So that when we project those state level estimates onto the county, uh, we might be kind of overestimating the strain a little bit. Um, but anyway, it can be done. There's just a lot of caveats that I would add to that. But yes, it can be done. Be very helpful. Very helpful. Yes, indeed. Any other questions from board members? Uh, this is Joan from the Housing Coalition. Um, Dr. Bentelli, am I saying it correct? Uh, is Bentley. Bentley. Thank you, Dr. Bentley. Um, I, I appreciate your comment about um, kind of the, I've been using the National Multifamily Housing Council rent payment tracker as, as one data point, but obviously that uh, I think your point is valid that that's kind of the more professionalized um, apartment rent collections. Uh, uh, but I do, I do see other, um, not, not, not necessarily for Arizona, but for um, other communities that public housing rent collection has also been pretty high up upwards of 92 to 96 percent. And so I'm just, you know, I think that there's some opportunities, you know, as we talk about the mom and pop landlords, um, to educate them on the rental assistance programs. I've been kind of beating that drum quite a bit lately. Um, and then I am, you know, to, to your point, I am pretty excited about the money that Arizona is, stands to receive with the, the, the latest relief package. So thank you for sharing this information. I think it's, and again, it is very much the data is so important, but what, how do you dive right in? So I really appreciate the detail you've given us. Thank you. And I'll just add very quickly that the, uh, the multifamily housing association data that you referenced does very clearly show weakening in November and December. And the December the December rent payments were, are are very low. Even even if, if it's it's three percentage points down from December last year, but that is a lot of households in, right. in practice, right? Because this is very good nationwide data, uh, but it does underrepresent those mom and pops. The other thing I'll say very quickly is I've been very uh, reassured by our uh, head constable here in Pima County, who has said that in her experience, uh, she will go to apartment complexes and there's nobody nobody there is having a hard time. And then she'll go to another very low income apartment complex and big chunks of those folks are being evicted and falling behind on their rent. So it's really, there, there's this high concentration again, as I keep saying, but I think that those, uh, those mom and pop and those lower end rental organizations, they're not as likely to be in these associations. They're not as likely to be captured in the survey data. Uh, so again, I think that these people are a little bit unseen to some extent, and, and that, and and I, like I was just saying, if the constable was saying that she's not seeing this in reality, that would be one thing. But that's that's not at all what we're hearing on the ground. If I could add, also, um, you know, you had that one uh, PowerPoint where, or one slide where it talked about you know borrowing money, uh, putting on credit cards, but also let's not forget. I mean, I think you mentioned this. All the all the data says that when there was that increased unemployment um, assistance, that was going to rent. When they, when people were getting the stimulus. Uh, funds that was going to rent when people were getting their taxes done that was going to rent when people get a flush of cash they don't spend it willy-nilly they spend it on rent uh, Keith was there a recent urban institute study I, somebody mentioned it I haven't seen it I don't know if you I'm sure you're tracking it that had it down to so even census tracks perhaps some of this data you know what I'm talking about I've seen it, I don't have it fresh in my mind right now. But uh, I, I, the reason why I haven't been using that as much is that, uh, unless it's very recent, but the one I'm thinking of is from a little while back uh, and, and has sort of been uh, not updated over time. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're thinking of a more recent study that came out. No, that thing's probably it, thank you. Uh, just the last thing I wanna say is that um, I, it is unambiguously the case that these numbers are not going to be as bad as what I've just shown, right? I, I think it's, it's very clear, especially the unemployment insurance, thank God uh, they got that in there. That is going to directly be targeted to unemployed households. So this is gonna really, really help enormously. I am very concerned though, again, about uh, people who are not connected to social services, people who are very low income. And then again, the folks who are most unable to access services who are very low income folks, some who may not be documented, some who may have language issues, et cetera, et cetera. These are the folks who are not going to be uh, supported disproportionately by coming stimulus. 
And so I want to encourage everyone to, you know, uh, think creatively about how do you reach those households? Because again, there may be funding there, but people may not be getting it in time. Uh, and that's an education issue. That's an outreach issue. And so I think now that, thank God, we don't have to worry about this huge over influx potentially of homeless people. Uh, we can maybe put a little more money and effort to, to focusing our efforts and, and to concentrate on outreach. And how do we capture these folks that otherwise may not uh, get the help that is available now or will be very soon, hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. Keith Benatelli. That was um, such a great presentation. And, and thank you so much for um, board members for all your thoughtful questions. Uh, in the essence of time, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which Thanks, is uh, responding to the eviction moratorium. And we're gonna have CJ Hagar with Vatalist who will present on responding to the eviction moratorium while addressing homelessness. Hi everyone, thanks uh, Madam Chair. Again, my name is CJ Eisenbarth Hager and I'm with Vitalist Health Foundation. For those of you who may not be familiar with Vitalist Health Foundation, we are a nearly 25 year uh, foundation based here in Phoenix, but we serve the entire state. And our mission is to connect, support, and inform efforts to improve the health, health of people and places in Arizona. Um, and over, I would say over the past decade, we've been slowly moving into social determinants of health. Uh, the most recent move has been the past two years as we've started to really dip our toes into how we can help play an additive role to addressing some of the housing needs of Arizonans. Um, so when the when uh, the pandemic happened and um, as Dr. Benatelli, um, described, we saw, as you all did, the, the weight of this on particular households, um, those being people of color, historically marginalized households, and folks with just not a lot of income to begin with. Um, and so we've been trying to really calibrate our response to focus on those folks. And I'll say that one of the big challenges has been on the housing side. We had been working a lot to support some of the existing work prior to the pandemic of uh, some housing organizations, including the Arizona Housing Coalition with their effort to establish a, a state housing tax credit and reinstate the um, housing trust fund. Um, also supporting the health insurers in developing the Arizona housing, the, the Arizona health uh, home matters, excuse me, I'm getting my terms mixed up here. I, I'm still on PTO, I, I apologize everyone. Um, uh, supporting the health insurers and in establishing the Arizona Home Matters Fund, which helps to fund um, some, some new housing here. So thanks to Mercy Care and others for their leadership on this. Um, as the pandemic started, um, we, we, we really tried to focus our efforts on how to respond. And I will say that it's been particularly challenging on the housing side. Um, we, uh, so when Sarah asked us to come and talk a little bit about our work in responding to both evictions and rental assistance, um, I just want to do a, a, a caveat by saying this is just one of our responses. I know that there are a lot of other things happening out there. Um, but this is one slice of, 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 the, of, of the work that's happening out there. And I would encourage you, if you have thoughts on how we as vitalist or philanthropy in Arizona can respond better to what's happening right now, please, um, please reach out to me or, or bring up a comment during our Q&A session. So I'll say there's two sort of main, I would, I would really say there's yeah, two, two main responses that we've been part of with respect to eviction prevention and, and rental assistance. The first one was we had heard along with other uh, foundations that there were many different rental assistance programs and there was not a lot of uh, unity between them. We talked to a lot of folks who are on the ground including Mar Marcel, Bruce, and others uh, who are doing this day in and day out. And they said, yes, that's the case because we just got inundated with money and we needed to get it out. How you can help right now though, that foundations and vitalist health foundations 
is to help connect people out on the street to these resources. So we have these resources that are going through CAP agencies and others. What we need are folks who can, can, can help uh, refer and connect people to those resources. That was what we heard. We took that back and we talked with some other foundations that we work with regularly, including Pulliam, the Arizona Community Foundation, and Piper. So this is, this is what we're hearing. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing in response is con helping to connect uh, navigators, people who are already helping folks. Um, thank you, Joan. Uh, uh, qualify and apply for assistance to get them to connected to rental assistance programs. So the Bar Foundation has an existing um, program where they help train people to connect people to rental assistance and eviction assistance. So right now we are in the process of connecting the navigators to the resources that the Bar Foundation has. So that if they're in the process of, of, of applying for food stamps, um, they'll also be asking, will you need rental or eviction assistance? And if the answer is yes, um, which, uh, you know, based on the conversation we just had is, is likely, sadly, um, they'll be able to do something about that. So that's one of the first things that we've, we're still working on it, um, but, I, but I think uh, things, we're making some headway in that, in that fashion. The second area that we um, are doing some work on, again, this is just looking at a 60 day emergency kind of situation, is connecting, is getting the word out on eviction prevention assistance. Um, so the Bar Foundation, again, has a website that they recently updated, and the uh, website is AZ Eviction Help. Um, it's been out there for a long time and they developed it with the U of A and some other folks um, some years ago. They just recently updated it during the mid, mid December and uh, we helped uh, pay for those upgrades. We are now in the process of developing a, um, a media campaign to help steer people to that particular resource. We've been working with the Arizona Community Foundation staff on developing some media outreach. We are in the process of working with Cox uh, Communications to buy some time to get the word out about AZ eviction help. And we're making sure that that website has the most up-to-date and current information so that if, when people contact that, it has um, information that's um, appropriate for folks who are who are in the throes of perhaps becoming evicted from their home. Um, again, these really focused on, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, these really focused on what can have impact over the next 60 days. I think also there's, a, right now within philanthropy, at least I think there's a unique point right now where there's attention being paid to these issues. So the question is, while we address the next 60 days, what can we also do to help shine a light on what can be done on a systems level basis? I think a lot of, there are a lot of foundations here locally that are focused on this right now. And so I think um, being able to shine a light on and provide some feedback to what could be done to help make sure some of, make sure this doesn't happen again, or make sure that the systems are in place to help quickly stabilize families who may be going through this situation. So I'll stop there, happy to, to, to hear suggestions, um, answer questions, anything like that. Thank you so much, CJ. Are there any comments or questions from board members? Thank you for your work, a huge thank you for your work. That the coordination piece is always huge. So very much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. And I think that that, um, you know, I think a lot of foundations shy away from working on housing related issues because it is very big and complex and expensive. I think this coordination role and the AZ eviction help uh, website and the media buys, those are relatively straightforward, easy asks for philanthropy. So I think 
this is a this again is a unique time. These are reasonable asks, and people can wrap their heads around. So I, you know, I, I encourage you all to, when if in the future there are similar asks, please reach out to me, and we're happy to help be a liaison with other foundations in the area because I think this particular ask is a very easy one for foundations to understand and see their role in. I could add, I would just say it also helps that we have a partner with CJ. CJ gets housing. She understands that. She has experience with it. Um, and so it, you know, as she just mentioned, it is so big, but she's a great like, conduit to the to our philanthropic partners to, to kind of break it down in, in more bite size. I love the idea of navigation. I, I'm a huge proponent of that. So you saw me dancing. But speaking of dancing, I, it sounds like it sounds like you um, have a connection with Cox to do some some media buys. I still want the TikTok with Bruce Liggett talking 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 about rental assistance. So you're on this, you're on the clock there, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, we have that on the list for Cox. So that I think the ask is, stay tuned, Bruce. You may be getting a call here any Thank minute you. now. I second that. <laughs> um, CJ, I was going to ask. Uh, First of all, it's great that the Bar Foundation does this and that you took this opportunity to grow it. So this isn't at all critical. Uh, and I've been remiss. I wanted to check it out myself. What's the customer experience like? Can they handle volume right now? Are they? I mean, how's it working? Uh, so they just recently um, updated it. So I will say that the, the, the recent data is still out because you know we haven't had time to, to work with it. I would say they are very, um, a lot of attention has been paid to the audience for this and the primary audience are families and people who are, um, who may be facing eviction. And so uh, a lot of attention has been paid to language and instructions and making sure that this isn't legalese, this is for a family that's in crisis right now and, and may not have a, a tolerance for complex uh, legal arguments. So I would say that the tone is very action oriented, very direct and, 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 and uh, geared toward action. We haven't got it since it just went live, I want to say earlier, late last week, I believe it was. We don't have any preliminary data on sort of what the response is to it yet. But I've, I encourage you to look through it. I've looked through it. It's very, it, it's very clear. It's very action oriented and um, really speaks to the experience of people who may be experiencing this. Great. Thank you. Oh, yes. It's, it's Eric, I completely agree. Um, fantastic resource and really great that y'all are kind of quarterbacking this and pulling it together. Um, and you probably have talked about this and um, so forgive me, but it does strike me that a lot of the local governments and this is a role MAG could certainly help with um, are gonna, this is like, you know, I imagine it's what local city council members and city managers and others are, well, a couple I've talked to are really struggling with this issue. So I, I, I would encourage as you do, as y'all do the promotion or as we all do the promotion that we also encourage that those um, municipalities that are really close to the ground have, you know, kind of plug and play this into their, um, into their websites, but also their game plans. That's great. A great. That's a great suggestion, Eric, and, and thank you for bringing that up. And I'll make sure and pass that along to our media folks. I think one thing that we were trying to be very cognizant of when we started to have early conversations with uh, Bruce and Marshall at the city of Phoenix is how inundated they are um, right now bet, with, with everything. And so, um, you know, Bruce kindly, and Marshall kindly gave us their time um, and they both really emphasized how exceptionally overwhelmed they are. So we wanna make sure that we're being very, very respectful of their time, knowing that um, they have a lot of people that they need to pay attention to. And we want to be an additive rather than a, something that takes, takes them away from their work. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, in the essence of time, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. But thank you so much, CJ. That was wonderful. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the COC board strategic planning session. 
Um, Sarah Kent, Human Services Planner at MAG, and the COC will facilitate a discussion around the survey that was sent out to all board members and seeking feedback for the COC board strategic planning sessions. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the Continuum of Care Board. As Tamara mentioned, and uh, I've introduced myself before, I'm Sarah Kent, um, and I'm here to give an update on uh, the board strategic planning retreat survey. Um, that we sent out, that would have been Monday, December 14th. Uh, so the survey asked questions around what outcomes board members would like to see, what data would be helpful in preparation for the retreat, what outputs the board would like to achieve, um, if there are various training topics of interest, uh, if the board uh, would want external stakeholders for part of the events, um, if the survey work or, or if survey work and input uh, from stakeholders prior to the retreat would be helpful, um, as well as to try to solidify the date and the time frame because um, it's quite clear that we're all doing such important work and are very, very busy. Um, so the outcomes, and I'll try to be as brief as I can because I know this is gonna be a, a great conversation. So I'll try not to go into too much much detail. I know that's hard for me because I am a, a bit of a talker. So here goes. Um, so for the outcomes portion of the questions, uh, the survey results made it clear that board members are seeking greater clarity uh, of the difference between the COC board and the role of MAG in regional homelessness efforts. So aside from defining the roles of both the COC and MAG in the regional efforts, board members uh, would like a greater understanding of how the COC board is organized and how they interact with other entities such as the COC committee, other subcommittees and work groups. Other outcomes that were mentioned um, are working on board recruitment uh, with a racial equity lens and leveraging more businesses uh, to collaborate with for flexible funding. Racial equity was something that was brought up a lot uh, during the survey results. So as far as data, the data that the board would like in preparation uh, for the board retreat as noted in the survey, our current plans that are in place, such as bylaws and budget, including MAG's administrative budget uh, for the COC, as well as MAG's org chart and job descriptions for staff were also requested. Um, board members are also interested in data from dashboards that we currently work with, built for zero, point in time, uh, various things like that. Uh, board members would like data on what other board members hope to achieve at the board strategic uh, planning retreat and I'd be happy to uh, share those survey results. As far as outputs, outputs the board would like to achieve from the retreat are developing clear roles, expectations and responsibilities of the board with timelines and benchmarks. Racial equity, again, uh, wonderful, came up um, and uh, wondering what the board's role is as, as this is a huge priority mentioned in the survey. Uh, the board members uh, mentioned in the survey also um, are seeking clarity around how the work of the COC is reported up through the MAG system. Um, there's also a need uh, mentioned in the survey to revamp the work groups and committees uh, and also to have some kind of a revised uh, mission and purpose so that everyone can move forward, whereas getting um, business, uh, more businesses involved, more landlords, mayors, and other diverse uh, communities involved. Um, as far as capacity building and training topics that were mentioned by board members via the survey responses, it was mentioned that board would like to see um, a comprehensive understanding of the Maricopa services system that includes providers, and policy governing uh, at work. Uh, also, there was a mention for the need of historical and current perspective of challenges and opportunities. Racial equity, again, uh, came up for the capacity building um, and, and training. Uh, one thing that was mentioned uh, in the survey as well is that it would, it would be nice to have a required racial equity training for all board members ongoing, as well as a 101 uh, COC level dashboard data analysis so that um, board members will feel more comfortable asking questions when digging into the current uh, data and how uh, you know we are measuring homelessness in our system. Um, so the board is also seeking clarity on how the COC uh, squares with built for zero model with the new regional effort underway. Um, and lastly, uh, racial equity and developing an ad hoc group with people with lived experience to be an advisory committee with decision making capabilities was mentioned. Um, so as far as external stakeholders, I'm sorry, I'm trying to zoom through this. Uh, the COC, uh, COC board was open to having external stakeholders. 
um, as such as facilitators or data providers or partners uh, in the regional planning efforts available for part of the, uh, the, the session. Although it was mentioned by one board member that the agenda should prioritize internal board processes and goals. Um, other stakeholders that were mentioned were uh, such as uh, entities such as Crisis Response Network or other entities that are involved in the regional strategy that's being built. Um, additional input that was given uh, that folks would definitely like to receive the, the survey results. Um, and also uh, tossing around the idea of sending out a survey to the community about what changes they want to see regionally and as a board. Um, so the date and time frame, and, and I'm hoping that we can have some discussion, not only just locking down the date and time frame, but also uh, other things that you, you would like to see in this board strategy session. So the majority of board members prefer two two hour sessions, the survey showed, with time frames uh, that avoid mornings. There was uh, one that said all caps, no mornings. So we are respecting that, no mornings. It, was it you, Tamara? Just kidding. Um, so it appears that the best dates will be the 5th, January 15th, which is a Friday, and January 22nd, which is a Friday, uh, about 2 to 4 p.m. That seemed like the common window. Um, but I, I would like everyone to, uh, to note that the January 25th, we also have a board meeting at 1.30. And so um, keep that in mind as we're going to be doing the awesome strategic planning session. And then the 25th will be perfect because then we can all come back together um, and really talk about what the magic that happened during, during the sessions. And I'm, I'm quite an optimistic uh, person. So um, I hope we can hammer that out. Uh, additional comments and considerations that board members wanted to share, the need for greater transparency of course that was mentioned um, and uh, it, it was also mentioned that uh, the COC board is underutilized and, and needs to be given jobs to shoulder the load with new member qualifications uh, needing to be developed as well. Um, so lastly I wanted to mention that um, due to a strategic planning event um, we checked in with our attorneys uh, to make sure that uh, just to verify if it was going to, in fact, be an open meeting. And we've learned um, that the COC strategic planning retreat is will be considered a public meeting and uh, we will need to allow for the public to view it. Um, and so as I finish up here, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, the the strategic planning agenda is yours as a board um, to really discuss and set. Um, and the purpose of the survey really is to collect your ideas so that we can really make it uh, what you all really want it to be. And so I want to pose a few ideas for your consideration. Um, first uh, is that the first session um, can feature possibly uh, a training uh, and discussion on policy leadership. Um, in the second session, some ideas, uh, just throwing them out there to you, uh, could potentially focus on ensuring the structure and membership of the board supports the goals of the board. That's some of the feedback that we received from the survey, just um, tossing those considerations out for you. Uh, also, Vitalist, uh, the wonderful organization we've got CJ on, has also offered to provide training on adaptive leadership uh, that can support the board in evolving um, in the policy work, uh, possibly in that first session. And then the second session, if you all agree or are into it, uh, can include consideration of roles, membership, functioning of the work group, subcommittees, committees, and then the board, of course. Um, this can also include a charter review and uh, after the retreat to make the necessary changes uh, that, that we need to make. Um, so any action identified at the retreat can be formalized and implemented with action taken uh, at the subsequent board meeting. And with that, I want to open uh, the floor for discussion. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. Any questions, comments, statements from board members? Sarah, I'll say it's a phenomenal amount of work that you did to capture all of our input. Um, so appreciated um, from that side. And I wonder once we jump into this, I just blocked the dates out on my calendar. Um, but once we jump into this, it, it feels like it's a pretty heavy agenda, um, you know, and so just 
I don't know, sort of being mindful about, you know, staying focused on kind of the keys, um, you know, that we need um, from this. And so, I, you know, almost like challenge us as a board to make sure that we, you know, spend en enough time focusing on the things that I think are incredibly pertinent right now, which for me is kind of like the regional focus and our role um, for that regional focus. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would agree with that. I, I would say that we should really be focusing on what our role is as a board and what our goals are going to be before, so we can really start to tailor our membership and our everything else that we're going to be working on after that. And I feel like that would have to definitely come first, just understanding, you know, what we want our, what we want the role of the board to be, what we think our priorities are going to be and how does that align with who we choose to fill the, the seats. I'm open to anybody else's feedback. Second, what Tamara and Samantha sh uh, shared, it would be great to have that foundational setting. And uh, those other items that were mentioned, like leadership and, 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 and the work alongside vitalists, that might be a great measurement, you know, some goals and, and that, that'll help the board with those goals. But I think let's do some foundational work first. Excellent. Any other discussion or um, anything around the dates or the time frame that jump out at folks? Anybody really love mornings and want to push back at all? Sarah, can you can I ask? Can you share the dates again, please? I apologize. Oh, no worries at all. So it seemed like the most popular dates were going to be the fifteenth uh, and the twenty second, and from sorry here. 2 to 4 p.m. Those are both Fridays. It definitely seemed like the two hour window was the most popular um, rather than four. And Madam Chair, if it's a purview of the committee, then we can certainly send out a meeting invite to hold that place and time on, on, a, on everyone's calendars. Great. All right, any other comments? Should we move on? I just uh, have one comment. Thank you all, this was great. And I really, um, Sarah, I really appreciate you going through the, um, doing such a great summary of what we all said. Um, I, I'm honest, I, I would like to encourage us as to the, to the best extent possible to be um, open for the community to, well, not participate, I guess. That's a hard thing with this, with what we're working on. But, you know, let's lean into the open meetings rule law and, you know, that we, we want, I, I think, you know, part of what all of this builds around, and I've talked, we've talked about it before, I've talked about it with a number of you all, is trust among all the different players. And so um, the more we can, we can, you know, push out this discussion so that at least folks can watch it, I think the, the better. Sorry, that's it. Madam Chair, may I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Great, thank you. Um, it sounds really good to have the focus on setting the, the foundation and being really clear on what is the role of the continuum and, 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 and the other groups um, that, that work with the continuum um, to have that first and then possibly some training after that. So would that be kind of flipping it then and having uh, more of the discussion in terms of the charter review, the role discussion in the first session and possibly training in the second session? Is that, okay, okay, great, thank you. I just wanna make sure that worked for everybody. Thank you. And, and I loved the other comment that what another board member had about the historical context and all the different players in Maricopa County, because even I don't even I don't know all of them either, and I'm sure maybe most of the board members don't. But it would be great to just kind of paint that picture a little bit more fully. And the only other agenda item I think we need to make sure we add is is Bruce and TikTok. Prioritize agenda item number one. <laughs> I was muted, sorry. If there's no other comments about the strategic planning session, we can move on to the next agenda item, number seven, which is an update on the regional efforts to end homelessness with Amy St. Peter, Deputy Executive Director of MAG. She'll provide an update on the regional collaborative on homelessness. Great, thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, 
we are hoping to be able to bring this item to you on a, on a regular basis and not just focusing on the collaborative, but really focusing on all different regional efforts. Um, you're absolutely a leader in this space and we want to make sure that um, you're able and really positioned very well to be able to coordinate with other regional efforts in this space. And so, for example, we've reached out to the United Way. They're working on their, on their strategic impact plan, which will include a focus on homelessness. And so we've asked them that they were not available to come today, but um, offered to come to, to our next meeting that, um, that, that we might have an opportunity for them to speak. So they're very excited about that. And um, we have Joan and, and the coalition serving on the board and, and giving regular updates as well. We think it's really critical to, um, to exchange all of those different activities, those points of information um, so that we can maximize our resources and our time as much as possible. Um, so with that in mind, I did wanna circle back with you about the regional collaborative. Um, we do have um, a, a, a graphic that illustrates the, the, the relationships that I'd love to share with you. And so if I may share my screen. Um, ah, there we go. Are you able to see this all right? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me see. Hmm. Are you able to, to, to read the graphics okay? Is the text too small? Is that okay? I can talk through it with you as well. Um, That'd be so, helpful. Okay, excellent. And and we'd be happy to um, to to share this document, post it on on the website as well as sending it out to all of you, so you can really dig into it and follow up with any other questions or insights that you might have at your convenience. So this is a visual display of the relationships and how we're seeing the the collaborative and it's really working hand in glove with you it's it's we are here to to support your work to further your work to amplify your work and so you can see right down here the foundation for this work is it is you it's it's our stakeholders um, for the individual entities and so we have the continuum of care our mag member agencies certainly the nonprofit providers as key constituents of mag and those have been listed very very high level form for each of the six entities who are part of the collaborative and so this kind of thin thin circle represents the the collaborative and just the way that we're coordinating with each other so using again the the united way as the example the united United Way um, is working with their constituents to develop their strategic impact plan. We're working with you to develop uh, different regional strategies to, um, to strengthen the infrastructure to address homelessness. We're both working in kind of very similar spaces with very similar audiences. And so we're sharing the, the information that we have right now with each other so we can leverage each other and we can support each other. And that's really what the collaborative is about. It's about that coordination. Now this larger, lighter shaded triangle, that's the outreach. And we can't do anything without these key stakeholders. Um, so absolutely with, with the providers, we have our first forum on um, this Wednesday, this week with the, with the leadership from, from the providers to, um, to be able to learn from their perspective. Also business, philanthropy and civic groups because this plan will need to be really supported by a broad array of different partners and the municipalities and the sub-regional efforts. By sub-regional, I mean the East Valley, the West Valley um, groups that are working to address homelessness as well as the significant efforts underway within the city of Phoenix. So all of these, um, all of these activities, these strategies will need to play, will, will need to take place in communities. And so it really needs to be embedded within those communities, which is why we really need these stakeholders. So we are looking to existing data sets that represent the insights from these stakeholders and others. We're also going out and doing some really targeted outreach, really very specifically asking questions about um, how can we best enhance the, the infrastructure, um, what kind of strategies um, might be most impactful at that regional level. From these, um, again, working together, sharing information, leveraging those existing partnerships and um, pulling together regional strategies and, and plans. Um, and then really, we're all focused on this key impact of people experiencing homelessness have better access to housing services and that strong safety net. And so this is how we're visualizing it. Um, you can see my notes here at the bottom when I was putting this together. Um, direct lines and individual circles don't work. They don't work graphically or visually and they don't work in terms of practice. And so it's important to point out that really the, the coordination and that sharing. Um, also something else to really emphasize that we're all working for that same goal. And so the collaborative isn't um, taking 
anyone's place. It's, um, it's not telling anyone what to do. It's simply leveraging the fact that we have um, some, some talented partners working in this space, all striving for the same goal. And so this is um, the way that we're conceiving it. We hope that this communicates it clearly. We really do appreciate the feedback that was received at, at the last board meeting and really do look forward to working with all of you. Um, we are updating um, your, your chair, Tamara, on a weekly basis in terms of all of our activities, both at MAG as well as through the collaborative, because we really wanna make sure that we're coordinating closely with you. And so if you'd like to be involved in any of the forums, anything like that, please do let us know. We'd love to be able to benefit from your expertise. Do you have any questions on this? Any feedback, any clarifications needed? Amy, can you um, kind of dive into the outreach that will happen with the business community? Yes, thank you for that. So we are planning a number of different forums. So the first one is this Wednesday with the nonprofit leaders. We'll also have one with frontline staff sometime during the month of January. We have the housing forum scheduled for February 17th. Um, and so if you have folks that, and, and, and some of you actually on the board would be considered a housing developer. And so we'd love to have you included in that. We are in the process right now of scheduling sometime in February, a forum with the business community. Um, and if you have ideas, um, kind of people who, who should be invited, anything like that, please do let us know. Whenever we schedule this forum um, and, and we get that, that invitation out, we will send that to the board. And so you have every opportunity to be engaged. So for the business forum specifically, we have some confirmed partnerships and one more in queue. We hope to finalize that by this Friday. So we're working actively with the Phoenix Community Alliance, Westmark and East Valley Partnership. We're also meeting with Greater Phoenix Leadership this Friday and we have our first planning meeting scheduled for next week. And so we'll be talking about what are the key questions that, that we need to ask, who should be involved, who should facilitate. Um, I do wanna thank Eric Cole for facilitating the Nonprofit Leader Forum this, this Wednesday. It's critically important to have those trusted messengers. Um, and so we thank Eric for his service with the Nonprofit Leaders and we'll be looking for similar trusted messengers for the other forums as well. Any other questions, feedback? Uh, Amy, this is Jackie. Um, just thinking about the the business um, outreach that you've have been that you've done so far, it's very Phoenix heavy, and I know you know there are other cities and towns in the region that are gravely concerned about what's happening in the area of homelessness. So I'm wondering about reaching out to some of the chambers or uh, other business type groups within the. East Valley, West Valley, yes. just more of a regional approach. No, agreed. Um, we really do want this to be truly regional. Um, and so that's why we'd reach out to Westmark and to East Valley Partnership. Um, and we're hoping that they can help to connect us. We are also reaching out to the chambers, um, but have not yet confirmed their partnership. Awesome. Excellent point. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Any other questions, comments, ideas? Marshall, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay audio problem. So just to piggyback on what Jackie said, I know you mentioned, thank you, Jackie, for that. And you mentioned Amy's follow-up chambers of commerce. Are you focusing on affinity chambers of commerce? So your greater, uh, your Arizona Hispanic chamber of commerce, your uh, Arizona black chamber of commerce, your native American chambers of commerce is, since we're talking about racial, yes. equity, I think there's a great opportunity. So just wanted to make sure we mentioned those and they're included. Yes, thank you very much, Marcelle. Great ideas. Um, Sapna has been following up on that, um, but if you, but if anyone can help us to make those those connections, that would be fantastic. That's absolutely on on the radar as well. I, I don't mind doing so. I can get you connected with someone who's connected with all of those. If you oh, will, great chambers, sub chambers, if you will, that shoot kind of off formally and informally the Greater okay. Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. So whomever reaches out to me, I'll work on the connection I have. Perfect. We will be following up right after. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other ideas, questions, direction? Okay, Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation. Um, if anyone does have ideas, um, questions, anything like that, comments, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Really appreciate your feedback on this. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, we will move on to agenda item number eight, MAG's role in addressing homelessness. Um, once again, uh, Amy St. Peter, Deputy Executive Director of MAG will present on MAG's current role in addressing homelessness. Excellent. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the board. We're very eager to have your, your feedback on this. Um, part of MAG's role is, is is, is staffing this board and, and all of your work. And so we take that very seriously and we're hoping to be able to increase the alignment, hoping to um, resolve any, um, any confusion or gray areas and really look forward to working with you in all of this. You do have a document um, that, that was sent out to you prior to the meeting that's for your review and for your consideration for action today. Um, just to, to frame the, the path of that document, we are bringing this to you first because we really want to start this conversation with you to get to get your input on this um, from from you. It will then go to the mag mag management committee, which are the city and town mayor uh, uh, managers and and the county managers as well. And then from there, it'll go to regional council. This was requested at the last regional council meeting in December by our mayors. Um, they had two requests actually at that time. They wanted us to, um, to describe MAG's role in, in regional homeless planning. And we were also asked at that meeting to consider our staffing needs in, um, in addressing homelessness on, on a regional level, keeping in mind that we are ramping up and wanting to serve you even more. And so we're asked to consider both of those. And so we are responding now with this document, starting with you and then bringing it forward to management committee and regional council then for action this month. So the document that you have before you has, has four main aspects to it. One is the history. So I thought the, the conversation in regard to the tree about the history and understanding that is really key. Um, we have to understand where we've been to know how we came to be where we are right now and to have an appreciation for where we might go. And so with the history of, of, of homeless planning at MAG that started before the continuum of care um, and, and in terms of um, our member agencies raising that as an issue, but our first really formal and intensive effort in this space was when the continuum of care came to MAG back in 1999. At that time, um, there wasn't, there weren't as many requirements from HUD as in terms of what that regional response looked like. And so our focus was very much rooted in the local communities and on the region. Since then, this work of course has become more complex, more technical, and it's been more prescribed as well. And so with the Hearth Act that um, offered some new, a, a new framework and that changed the dynamic um, between MAG and the continuum of care. Um, it required a lot more attention on the federal priorities as a result. Um, part of our mission to serve the region is to maintain that federal funding. And so we really do need to make sure that we're keeping that federal funding that funds flowing into the region. Um, we are really wanting to reset though and make sure that in the process of complying with the federal requirements, we aren't losing sight of those regional and those local needs and, and priorities and opportunities. So, um, so, the, so the history does come into play there. The document also does offer some, some guiding principles um, it's our commitment to how we will be conducting this work. It's not just important what we do, it's important how we do it. And so you'll see that we have four main areas that this work will be regional. So homelessness is of course regional in nature and the solution needs to be regional in nature as well. So truly embedded within the East Valley, West Valley, and of course, Phoenix. This work inherently needs to be sustainable and needs to be financially and politically sustainable. Um, so we need to make sure that we have the resources in place and um, we need to make sure that we have the political will and the community support to be able to not just implement these strategies, but to really um, to, to make sure that we can keep them going for the long-term. It's a long-term kind of commitment there. This work inherently needs to be inclusive and that's inclusive of different race, uh, races, ethnicities, gender and sexual identities, um, as well as people with, with lived experience. And so we need to make sure that our work reflects the people that, that we're working so hard to serve. And this work needs to be accountable. And we really need to make sure that um, we're not just making promises, that we're delivering action. And we need to make sure that we're very clear on what those outcome measures are. We need to make clear on what we're trying to achieve and that we have a way to document progress on that and to make those mid-course adjustments as, as needed. The document also offers a timeline for these activities. So you'll note that the, the, the forums are there that we're proposing, I'm um, working very closely with you to offer the regional strategies in May and then to move into to implementation then um, beginning in June. 
a few changes that have been um, requested or suggested since, since we've sent this document to you that I'd like to run by you today. Um, one of those is to really, really strengthen the, um, the relationship between the continuum of care and, and, and the board. Uh, and, 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 and regional council. So that's present through the recommendations. We have a few of those in the, uh, in the document. And the first of those really is to align the regional council with the continuum of care board. And um, some, some folks ha have looked at that and they agree with that and they say, how, how are we going to do that? So one option for that could be through the targeted um, member recruitment. Also possibly the board considering expanding the size of the board um, so that you can address your other priorities, but also possibly to include more, more board members from the cities, the towns, the counties, um, to make sure that we have that very strong relationship because we need to be able to implement these strategies in communities. So we really need the clear partnership and commitment of communities. And so that's, that's one way of doing that. The other recommendations um, also uh, to, of course, to develop these regional uh, strategies to enhance the, the infrastructure to address homelessness, and then a request for two new staff members. One of these would be a data analyst that could be housed within our analytics team here at MAG, and then the and, and, and would be funded by that team. The other would be a program manager um, that we could uh, potentially use the HUD planning grant funds and the homeless planning assessment to fund that position. The benefit of that program manager is that it's one person leading our talented planning team here who's exclusively focused on homelessness. This is absolutely a full-time job and more, and we need someone who can devote all of their attention to this critical issue that also frees up our human services director to be able to address, to, to still, still lend support, but also be able to, um, to work with our cities or towns, our nonprofit agencies then, to be able to address those more um, general human services needs. And so um, we are, so after an assessment of our staffing, and I hear that you would like more of a job description and org chart, and we are absolutely happy to provide that as well. We are proposing to add two new staff members to that. That could take place uh, immediately upon approval, um, or, and or it could take place when our new work program and budget um, are up for approval in May. So there's a number of different options and more depending on, on your feedback. So circling back then to those changes, one was um, really wanting to enhance the representation of, of, of our um, cities, towns, counties serving on the board. Um, another one is to add more detail about the implementation plan. Um, so we have um, added um, to clarify in the document right now, so it just says June and beyond. We've clarified that pending your feedback to indicate that we'll develop a tactical plan to implement these strategies in June. And then um, we'll very clearly identify the commitments, the funding, um, and, and the support available to be able to implement these strategies. And then to have that implementation plan then approved, again, starting with you as driving this effort um, in, in August, and then going to management committee and regional council as well, again, in an effort to really fully engage the cities, the towns, the counties in implementing um, these very important strategies. So that's an overview of the document. That's an overview of the changes received to date. This is for your action today. And we appreciate any, any discussion, any feedback that you might have on this document. Any questions, comments, concerns from board members? I think the work that, that you've done, it was very impressive. And you know, I commend you all for that. You know, I'm going to be honest, I don't really know the totality of who our staff are that are connected with the continuum of care anymore. And, and that, that's just a point of interest. Then that, I think, would give us a framework to see how the new positions interface with the existing positions. Um, I appreciate the call for transparency. And, you know, I, I, as a board member, I don't want to be like the micromanager but to at least have broad uh, perspective, like what is the line item budget for continuum of care staff and how many FTEs does that fund? And that, it's the same kind of transparency that, that I think those of us that report to boards um, are accountable for. So personally, I, that, that would be very helpful to see. Absolutely. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, I have... 
Let me see. Um, hmm. No. I do have a document that I would be happy to, to, to share with you. Um, so it, it, this, the, this document gives, gives an overview of just that. So in terms of our budget, um, that is available um, in the HUD application that we submit for the planning funds. It's also available on the MAG website in terms of our, in terms of our agency budget. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. That is very transparent. In terms of the staff you have, I think all of us <laughs> here, here in the call right now, um, the planning grant specifically supports um, Sarah and she is now staffing the board. And so she is taking the lead on policy. Looking through, um, in terms of Steve, he is now staffing the work groups and he is, um, he is supported by the planning grant as well. Tina Lopez is also submitted in part, not, not completely, as, um, as a supportive admin staff. You also have Julie Montoya, who's doing great work leading um, the racial equity work, as well as um, spearheading the data subcommittee. So those are the staff members that you have right now. My time, um, Sutna's time is not charged at all to the planning grant. That's MAG's commitment to this work. Brandy is currently charging her time to the HUD planning grant because of her really hands-on efforts in this space. If these two new positions are approved, um, then the program manager would basically replace Brandy's time on this project. So with the, with the new grant that's coming into play, we're looking at $795,000. Um, the, the line items for that are um, two main categories, and one is labor, um, fringe, and overhead. And so that would, um, so for the six positions then that would be funded by the planning grant, um, that's um, $620,000 of that. That leaves $175,000 for the board to really direct in terms of, do you want consultant studies? Do you... Um, want to make other resources available. So that funding would um, um, hasn't been uh, allocated by line item yet because we, because we want and need your, your feedback on that. So that's really for the board to, um, to direct. Um, we do have that document. I'd be happy to, um, to send that out after this meeting. Um, if I can figure out a way to share my screen, I, I do have it on my, on my desktop as well. And Madam Chair and Amy, if I may um, just add to what you, to your comments, Amy, as far as current staff goes, we also have a vacant position um, for the continuum of care, which is a systems planner position and that job description um, and posting is on our website now. Um, yes. So, you know, we would encourage members of the board to help um, help us recruit for that position. So if you can forward that out to anyone that you think might be interested, um, that is a current open position that we have in addition to the two new positions that Amy is talking about today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Brandy. So right now the CFC planning team, um, including the vacant um, spot would be those four positions. So the vacant one, um, Sarah, Steve, and Julie, Tina as admin for a portion of time, and right now Brandy um, for a portion of her time because of her, her efforts with this. So the new program manager would replace Brandy's time and the data analyst position would be funded by our regional analytics division. Thanks for that, Amy. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm kind of echoing Jackie's um, comments and I, this is great. I mean, I, all of the, the tone of this meeting and the approach to, to, to working you know, more collaboratively has been great uh, on this, in this call. Um, but is there, I mean, is there a timeliness around, I mean, I'm, I'm fully aware that you've, you know, we're, we're supposed to uh, approve or, or vote on these positions. Is there a, a, a reason that needs to happen this month versus next month? And I mean, before I, the reason I'm asking that is I think along with, you know, the greater transparency and y'all are clearly offering a great deal, we need time to be able to kind of review budgets and understand this um, uh, as well. And then I have a follow-up question too. Okay, um, we are wanting to be timely in our response to the regional council. Um, so we can, um, that we can let them know that the board wasn't ready to act on that, on that portion of the document. Um, so we can let them know that. Uh, okay, hoping to I mean, get yeah, no, I, and again, I, I, I certainly, like I'm not, I'm not proposing that. I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna slow it down unnecessarily. Um, I, I guess my follow-up question, and, and this is one of the, I mean, I was one of the people that talked about understanding our internal processes better and in, 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 um, in the survey um, is just, I, 
it's not been clear to me that this is the kind of vote the, that the COC board would take versus something that is more you know, handled administratively um, by MAG itself. And so I'm not really offering an opinion on either way. It's just, I don't know what you know, <laughs> is, is <laughs> in our bylaws or in our operating procedures, is this something that we would traditionally vote on, I guess is what I'm asking. Right, right, absolutely. No, no, thanks for that. You know, and, and there's a bit of a balance because um, we've been hearing loud and clear from the board that you'd really like to have more of a focus on policy issues. And in some ways, staffing is more of an operational issue. And so um, right now we're working, we're running kind of, uh, we're uh, staffing both paths, you know, we're, we're trying to support the board and pivoting to more policy issues, but we're also wanting to be transparent with you about those operational issues because we've heard questions about that as well. And so we're, we're responding to the request that, that we've been receiving on both of those. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Amy, this is Ryan. May I ask a question? Of course. Thank you. Um, so um, ditto on just wanting to understand, I guess, the budget better a little bit. So are we, are you saying that um, we would use the continuum of care planning grant to bring on two additional staff that will assist with staffing the collaborative? No. Or, okay, I think I'm confused. No, no, sorry, the, the, the collaborative isn't part of this discussion at all. Okay. Um, they're, they're an external partner and, and we certainly work closely with them, um, but know that the program manager would be exclusively focused to the continuum of care and MAG's efforts to staff regional homeless planning. And the data analyst um, would be brought on exclusively focused to regional homeless planning to serve the continuum of care, MAG's role in regional homeless planning. And that would be funded actually um, outside of the, the HUD planning grant. Okay, gotcha. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for asking. I wouldn't want anyone to <laughs> be confused on that point. So thank you. Madam Chair, it's Marshall. Amy, just one quick question. One, thank you for the overview and the update. And I just did what everyone else has said and want to appreciate the support. One of the suggestions I would have, and I know the challenge is going to be this, things are moving so quickly. And I know you all are trying to manage, as you said, having to manage a regional council with the request of the COC. Um, COC, I'm sorry. But if there's opportunity, I know for myself, thank you one for your overview because I was on vacation the past 10 days. So I didn't get to read the document until maybe 20 minutes before the meeting started. So it was helpful one for you to give the overview. But since we are saying that this is a collaborative and everybody's working together mm -hmm. and because genuinely there are commitments being made by MAG to say we're gonna keep all players engaged. I just wanna make sure where there's opportunity to mm -hmm. give us a little bit more time mm -hmm. to read and give feedback, that would be helpful because I know I got an email earlier today from our government relations about a similar document saying, are you all meaning staff okay with this? And mm -hmm. I know if we vote as a CFC today to say we're okay with this, the presumption will be coming. I know for Phoenix and I don't know about others in the government space, but we've read it, we've vetted it and we're fully comfortable with it. I can't necessarily say that I am I'm supportive of it, but I can't say I fully have vetted it because I just haven't had. It. So mm -hmm. I say that not as um, a negative or anything. I know every, you're trying to do the best you can, but when there are opportunities to create a little bit more time to review it in a substantive way and give us some time mm -hmm. to talk through it, that just would be helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, thank you so much. We had started vetting this document um, with the cities and towns um, and, and, and with the human services directors in, in, in mid-December, uh, but completely understand if, if you would like more time, then we can certainly report that to management committee and to regional council. Um, this is on, on the agenda right now for, for management committee for next week. Um, so if you'd like more time, we can certainly let them know that. Um, and if you'd like to vote on a portion of it, for example, on, on the document um, without the staff request, um, because you'd like to have further dialogue about that, then we can certainly offer that as well. Um, with, with management committee, I think it's on the agenda um, in just that way um, to recommend approval of the document or the action would be for their consideration um, and possible action then to recommend approval of the two new staff positions. And those, again, those staff positions could be added now or with the new work program that would, that would be voted on in May. So we wanna make sure that we're absolutely including your, 
your, your feedback on this. And we understand it's, it's, it's tough with people, you know, just being out of the office and all of you are busy too. This is not your full-time job necessarily just to serve as a board member. Um, so if it's helpful for you, we very much want to do it right and not just do it quickly. Um, so we lo really look to you for um, whatever direction you, you'd like to take on this. And we're always available to, um, to meet with you one-on-one -on -one, um, to go over any other um, concerns, ideas, questions that anyone might have. So thank you for that. Um, I, I had the same feedback you did, Marshall, and but I, I was thinking about how this is more of like the, the foundational document that we will continuously work on and improve together. And that, that like in my head, I was thinking like this was the, the initial kind of proposal. And then we would be working with it together to improve it, you know, pretty much forever, <laughs> constantly, because the role is going to shift and our roles are going to shift, our goals are going to shift based on what's happening externally. And so I don't know if that helps in, in folks thinking about it, but that's kind of where my, where I was going. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Eric, I heard a male voice. Who did, who was that? Was Bruce. Bruce. Oh, and <laughs> Bruce, was that you? Yeah, Sorry, that. Madam Chair and, and Amy, you know, given the uh, given the broader scope of what we're trying to do here, uh, it really isn't a surprise that you propose that we need additional staff to actually um, effectively execute that that regional approach. So, um, you know, I'm very supportive of that. And I, if members need time to to think about that more, um, that's fine as well. I, I'm just going to put it out there. I I would. I'm gonna make a bold um, motion that we do approve these two staff so that we can get started and not have to delay the work. Um, I would second that, uh, but I guess I don't know if you would characterize the process the way I've been thinking about it, Amy, but uh, I think this is an incredibly ambitious plan. Um, and as uh, I think like an administrator, so I thought like, this is a ton of work and who's gonna do all this work and how are they gonna get it? And so, you know, if this were mine, I'd say like, I'm gonna need a couple bodies to do a lot of stuff. And so, but I really, you know, the discussion we're having as a board about the budget and what Amy shared with us just now uh, is I think really important. And I also think a statement about how much more we're gonna be able to get into these down the road. Uh, and I guess after seconding, I'm supposed to ask a question, but did, are, are you making a multi-year commitment to these positions, Amy, or at this point, are you thinking this is a one year? How, how are you viewing that? No, we're, we're really seeing this as a long-term commitment. Um, so there's no time limit on the positions um, and there's no time limit on the support from the other teams at MAG as well. Um, we're, we're all in on this for the long-term. I guess. So my support for Jackie's motion is really based on, it's very general, the t magnitude of the work that needs to be done, the urgency and the time frames to be in a position in May to talk to specifically about uh, uh, strategies uh, and some big ones, I hope. So um, yeah, that's why I would uh, defer um, and, and support moving forward. Thank you very much. May I ask a clarifying question, Madam Chair? Can you hear me? Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, first, I, I really appreciate all of your support on this. We're absolutely thrilled to be able to work with you. Um, these are really unprecedented times when we've had, it, and it's concerning the amount of need, but also the level of support from, from you, from, uh, from leaders throughout the region. So really excited to be able to work in this. Just wanted to clarify, um, is a motion also to recommend approval of the document? Are you comfortable with the document? Um, and that includes the two new positions? I, I just wanted to make sure I, I was understanding that appropriately. That's directed to me, right, Amy? Yes, please, Jackie. Um, I, I'm right now focusing just on the two positions. My, I feel like Marshall, I, I also read the, and I know it's no, it's Sarah got the materials out early, but with the holidays and everything, it was literally 
20 minutes before the meeting. And there's like 50 pages of information to digest. Part of that was the study um, that we just heard about. But um, yeah, for me, I, if I'm more comfortable two-stepping this just to give us all a chance to uh, get up to speed with you all. And, and that that's probably some of the frustration if you're picking up on that is that a lot has been, a lot of groundwork has been laid. And I think as a board, I'll speak for myself. I feel like I'm coming in uh, late in the late in the ball game. So um, personally, I, I would like to just two step this approach. Okay, no, thank you. I, I appreciate that clarification. I just wanna make sure that we're responding in line with your direction. Mr. Yes. Samantha, I have a question. Um, Tamara had mentioned that this was a, a working document. And so as we vote, I think if that's a kind of a critical piece is that there can be changes and amendments and, you know, and things like that. So as long as that holds true, that it's a working document, I'm, you know, I'm supportive of moving forward. Um, uh, this is Joan, uh, Madam Chair, Amy. Um, I am just, I think a little confused. Um, Apologies. I actually feel more comfortable moving forward on a moving living document and, and have just um, a little bit of concerns about the position, the two positions. I'm like all like I, clearly we we have some capacity that every organization that <laughs> I see faces for we, we have some capacity issues. Right. So I'm all for that. I just want to get, um, I feel like that foundational strategic planning session will give us a better understanding of MAG, the staff assigned to MAG and all the different, um, the board first and the budget. And then I feel like like maybe like the second we finish, then you can like push posts on the job description and we'll feel more comfortable. Because again, I don't want to delay. I totally want to be loud and clear. I do not want to delay. We all have capacity issues. But I just, I have to, I feel like I need to do a little bit of, uh, of, of saying, okay, what if that money could be best, better utilized? And again, I know we are not staff for the board, but the board is feeling, you heard from the survey that they're being feeling underutilized. And is this, this the right strategic direction that, that might come out of the strategic plan, in which case we've already spent the money with bringing on new positions. So I'm just expressing that concern there. Absolutely. No, and, and, and thank you for that. We have started, um, I, because I had the question, well, how do other continuums staff their efforts across the country? So we've started pulling data, and, and Sarah's been great with, um, about working with me on this. So we've started pulling data, and um, it's really stark. <laughs> so we've been pulling data from pure regions, so we have kind of more apples to apples comparison, but also from any continuum who are responding and then breaking it down to per capita. So if, for example, when, when you look at the Denver continuum of care, um, they have 2.9 million people in their population. We have 4.5 million in, our, in, in Maricopa County. They had 6,000 people in their, in their pit count. We had 7,000 people in our pit count. So not exactly, we're, we're a bit bigger than, um, than them, both in terms of population as well as um, the, the street count um, and, and, the, and the shelter count data. They have nine staff members. <laughs> we have four currently who are exclusively dedicated to this incredibly important topic. Plus they have an additional 11 staff members on top of that for a total of 21 because they're also doing HMIS and coordinated entry in terms of a staffing capacity. And then when you break that down per capita um, uh, from, from the regions that we've heard back from so far, um, typically they'll have one staff member to every three to 500,000 people from their general population. We have one to 1.4 million. So in terms of do we need more staff, Oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> we definitely need more staff. Um, it just, just offering another option and I'm completely open to however, whatever pace, whatever detail you would want um, that, that, that you feel comfortable with at this point. And I know this is really tough timing with just even having this meeting. So thank you for coming to a meeting the first day back from, from the holidays and the break. That just, that speaks hugely to your commitment to this. One, one idea is um, if you feel comfortable, you, um, we could present it as, that you're fully supporting the addition of staff to be further. And then we could add a note that these are the ones that we're talking about right now in terms of data analyst and program manager, but to be further refined by the continuum of care board at their strategic planning retreat. So then we could um, give management community regional council an idea of the kinds of work that we're envisioning right now, but that would be further refined by you. And we would not post a job 
without talking to you first, because we want to make sure that we're really aligning this with um, where we can have the most impact. So just to throw out another option for consideration. So Madam Chair, Amy, I, speaking as a board member and also as a CEO that works with the board, uh, I know we've talked about being underutilized as board members. The fact of the matter is uh, we're volunteers. Mm -hmm. And this is one of many things we have to do in our day-to-day -day jobs. We all have other jobs to do. Um, and I'm not discounting that the, our, our input is, is critical. But as a, as a CEO, which I could, let's, let's translate like the role of Amy as our CEO or however you want to look, Sarah, it doesn't matter. But <clears throat> having staff that they can rely on, having staff whose feet they can hold to the fire um, and who they can manage on a day-to-day -day basis, that's really going to be the only way to really advance the work of the, the continuum, I believe. I, it's noble. I like to be noble and think that, yes, you know, let me be part of your workload, but that's not, I'm going to be honest with you, that is not realistic from where I sit. And I, I think as we're considering a vote on this, um, I think we need to ask ourselves um, to what extent are we willing to, to commit to be the legs that, that carry the work? I don't know if that makes sense at all. No, Jackie, it does, you know, and in support of my motion, actually, <laughs> and, you know, and, and just maybe another way of framing it too. I mean, I really see the board as, as driving the work in this space. So if we're looking at a body, you're the head and then we as staff are your hands and your feet, <laughs> you know, so we're doing the legwork, we're hands-on um, and we appreciate whatever time you, you can give us certainly um, and understand the and appreciate the thoughtfulness that you're all bringing to this conversation, really wanting to delve more deeply into the document, understanding that you've had very little time to, to, to do so, and really wanting to make sure that we're exactly aligning who we're bringing on in terms of staff with the work of the committee. Um, so we're happy to, to take any direction that, that you'd wanna give. Amy, is there a way to, I mean, I like what you just said about the motion that, that it's kind of like, here's the plan, the live plan, Mm -hmm. And here's the position types that we, and so Jackie, would you entertain that revised motion? Yes, let me, may I, may I restate my motion, Madam Chair? Or do we have to vote the first one down? And, and I feel like we have a public comment on this too. So I wonder if we should hear that before we vote. Yes, yeah, sounds great. It, well, sorry. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Would you mind reading Jennifer Dane? Is it Dane Grimond or Dane Grimond? Dane Grimond. Dane Grimond's written comment. Thank you so much. <laughs> Would love to. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, women and members of the board. Um, this is a written comment from Native American Connections. Uh, Native American Connections offers the following as a written comment on item eight, MAG's role in homelessness planning. And it's in quotes, uh, Native American Connections appreciates the attention on regional efforts to address homelessness. Generally, we'd like to see clear distinction between the anticipated roles of the continuum of care and the Maricopa Association of Governments. Perhaps more decision between MAG staff, COC board members, committee and subcommittee is needed for this to become clear. Specific to the document provided, Native American Connections has a couple of comments. From page two, section two, sustainable item B. It is important to create a regional plan that is wide reaching, offering meaningful responses to homelessness and housing. This can be followed by creating the political will and viability needed uh, to see strategies come to fruition. While not stated in the document, it is hoped the work include uh, identification of the policies which create barriers to ending homelessness or contribute to homelessness. It would follow that advocacy towards changing policy would be a regional focus as well, uh, whether at a local, state, or federal level. Uh, next, from page two, section three, titled Inclusive, the document provided does not specifically call out racial disparities. This needs to be a priority and part of the framework of the regional work plan. The efforts should also acknowledge the representation 
from the groups most impacted needs to come in uh, the form of seats at the decision making tables and not just incorporated and, and not just the incorporation of the voices of people. Grassroots groups and organizations would be an asset to the work beyond those affiliated with nonprofit providers and the business community. Thank you. That concludes the written public comment from Native American Connections. So much, Sarah. Thank you. So now, well, Madam Chairwoman, shall we uh, take a motion to approve? And I, I can do roll call as well. How did you, after hearing that, did you want? How did you want to word your yeah. motion? Oh yeah. May I offer what I've heard, Jackie, for your consideration? Yes, please. Okay. Um, and and this is what I've heard. Please tell me if 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 you've intended it differently. Um, what I'm hearing potentially is that you would recommend approval of this as a working document with additional refinements um, to the document, as well as to um, the uh, responsibilities of the two new proposed staff members by the Continuum of Care Board. So perfect. Good. Do I have a second? I'll second it. It's Eric. Thank you. And Sarah, would you mind doing a roll call vote? Love to. Can I ask, and I, it's Marshall, Madam Chair, I apologize. And I know I'm probably violating Robert's rules of order. <laughs> um, so I apologize. Just real quick, just quick comment on that. I just wanted to ask, I'm, gonna, I'm comfortable with the motion. I only want to add a little suggestion. Can we make sure in the purpose or somewhere it's clearly defined? It's a working document. It's living, it's breathing, it's evolving. I know we're saying it, but if it's not written that way, folks will look at that and think it's a permanent document. So that was it. Thank you. Yes, no, absolutely. And um, that, no, really agree with that. And we can really emphasize that we're recommending for this uh, approval of this as a working document with additional re refinements to be made by the Continuum of Care Board. And I'll, I'll just add, I know, sorry, I'm just going to, if we're still in out of order, sorry, thanks, Marcel. Um, I'll just add, like, I'm totally comfortable as a board if we if we come back and revisit that document, revisit the document, you know, address it, you know, as, as a board priority, because I do think it's really important to have it be, a, you know, a, a living, but also a policy document of ours. Um, but I've been convinced on the necessity of speed with everything else. So I think I think it's a good motion. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. And, and just to clarify, that's completely appropriate point of order. <laughs> so there's been a motion and a second discussion is absolutely part of the way that this should go. Um, so, so that's good. And I, I just wanted to make sure to, and um, just to highlight this point to make sure that it wasn't lost in the conversation or, or, or lost in translation, um, that part of the feedback that we had received was to um, potentially expand the number of seats available on the board for the for the members for, for additional members from the cities and towns. So, um, I just want to make sure that that's on your radar as well. I, I don't want you to be uh, I don't want you to be surprised by anything further on in the process. So, if that's acceptable, then we can we can add that. Yes. Oh, Ryan, I think you're on mute. Were you trying to provide a comment as well? Yes, thank you, Amy. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I am, uh, I, I think with um, the, if we could make a formal addition that this is um, a draft document and a first, like a first draft of a document and that it is uh, moving forward as a um, living document to be worked on I think I could um, support it. I'm very supportive in general of what's happening here, but like other people and I, you know, some people have a board to answer to, I have a council to answer to, I will just need some time to work with through our process so that I can alert staff. My fear is that this moves on to regional council, you said next week, and was it next week? Sorry, it's management committee next week and regional management. council at the end of the month. Okay, so it goes to management, even worse, management committee next week, <laughs> and depending on how you look at it. Um, and I have not even been able to um, bring it forward, you know, up through management and um, hear their 
feedback on it and be able to provide some of that feedback here. Um, I have some of my own feedback that actually has nothing to do with the positions. I don't think that I've, you know, I don't want to belabor um, this process, but I, just as an example, you know, we haven't really been able to even talk about our own feedback about the language, let alone sort of the feedback of, of what uh, the, the people that we represent might have. So again, you know, I want this to move forward. I understand um, the urgency and, I, you know, urgency is a good thing in our field. We, we need this urgency to get anything done. So I don't want to hamper that in any way, but I also don't want to speak out of turn in terms of saying, hey, my organization can completely support this language when this is really a first look at it. So if, we, if there's some way that we can make that exponentially clear, um, I could move this forward, but there is, you know, I will be frank, there is some language in here that while needed in terms of advocacy is gonna be a stumbling block um, that's going to need some time with leaders to, uh, you know, finesse a little bit mm -hmm. um, to the point where they can fully support this. So I don't want it to get, I don't want it to die right. just because we haven't had a moment to let us kind of finesse it so that they can accept this and move forward with it. That would be the goal. No, thank you so much. Um, and really do appreciate that. And I, I anticipate um, possible changes at, at management committee as well, but even possibly at, at regional council, whatever changes are suggested or requested, we would circle back with you um, to make sure that, that these are in alignment with how you want to proceed as well. So I see this really as a dialogue um, and really appreciate the opportunity to, to um, hear your perspectives and to be able to, to strengthen the document because if there's anything in there that will give pause, if it's going to give pause at the beginning of this work, it'll definitely give pause at the end of it. Right. Not that this work ever ends, you know, but once we're implementing strategies and things like that. So, um, so I do think it's really critically important to be clear on where we are right now, but to be open to continuing that conversation as we move forward. So is there a way then to actually add something to it that says this is a first draft, oh, um, open to change, do, do, do? Um, in the motion that as we have it right now and subject to, to change, it's called, it's specifically called a working document with additional refinements to be made. Um, okay. We can also hold off on it too. I mean, if you want to wait until February, we can do that as well. Um, I don't want you to feel pressured to take any action that you're not ready to take. Okay. Bruce? Um, so I really appreciate what Ryan was just saying. Uh, and I work for a manager and a board too. So we all have to do those things. And, and you're sending these, to our intergovernmental people have them and have reached back to me and is briefing our board chair and all of that. So that's kind of working right now. Just a, a point to be how we get considered. I see a window of opening here for really this board to step up more meaningfully and to be included more meaningfully and have more access to information. I, I, I don't know if I, uh, it, Ryan, if you'd be comfortable not putting draft all over it or how we're characterized in this. Let's take advantage of this opportunity strategically. Let's not be perceived as, oh, the COC board wanted to get into the weeds and we're worried about some of the wording and all that. I mean, you know, I'll convey it like, well, there was support for this thing. And, you know, we just got it. It's the holidays. People were busy. and But we're comfortable that you know, things can change in this document and be reviewed. So it's a working document, but it's a foundation we're starting from and adjustments will be made. I think as long as we don't kind of come off as a step uh, 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 or a potential barrier, I think we'll be perceived as like helping drive the speed of the process, which I think is the urgency we all have. Yes. Appreciate that, Bruce. I do too. Okay, so we had a motion and a second. May we head to roll call? Sarah? Great. Uh, we'll go with Ryan Balch. Aye. Eric Cole. Aye. Liz DaCosta. Aye. Marshall Franklin. Aye. Tad Gary.
Tad. I think you might be on mute. Tad Gary? Actually, I don't see him in the meeting anymore. He might have had to drop off. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we've got uh, Jackie Taylor. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Jackson. Hi. Bruce Liggett. Hi. Joan Service. Hi. Charles Sullivan. What I saw Charles on. Charles Sullivan. He is here. He's on mute. Are you able to speak, Charles, or in the chat even? And then we'll move on to Tamara Wright. Hi. Okay. The motion passes. That was a really, really great discussion from the board. Thank you so much. We're way over time, <laughs> but um, let's just go ahead and, and try to, to just get through the rest of our agenda, if y'all don't mind. Um, if uh, Joan, you wouldn't mind giving us a brief legislative update? I have like 15 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so federal um, January 20th is gonna be a good couple, it's, it's gonna be a good day. Uh, but this week we still have to figure out what's happening in Georgia. Federal. Okay, that's what we also just that's on our radar. Um, state uh, session starts soon. We are working um, on creating, uh, enacting the state low income housing tax credit and restoring the state housing trust fund. We have a bill sponsor to our, our two appropriations, Senate appropriation um, and House appropriations are sponsoring the. Um, the chair people are, are sponsoring the state low income housing tax credit. And I think the housing trust fund is either is most likely gonna be a budget conversation instead of a bill. So um, that's exciting on that end. And um, happy to entertain any questions or comments. I'm trying to be brief, but so ask, ask away. Okay, thank you so much, Joan. Um, let's just go right through this. Are there requests for future agenda items? We'll probably nail those in our strategic planning session as well. So um, maybe just take some time to think about that. We've covered a lot of things today and my brain's already just like, uh. Um, okay, comments from the board. Is there anything, um, any announcements or events that the board would like to highlight? Um, I just want to make everyone aware, in case you have not been made aware, that we are um, postponing the Maricopa County stand down. Um, we are um, obviously, you know, have to pay attention to public health concerns. Um, we are looking at uh, what it would mean to partner with, um, we're looking at a couple different paths, maybe looking at other events uh, that occur in the valley in the fall, or doing a very targeted event. So just uh, stay tuned on that. Awesome, thank you. Um, I did have one thing we are having for, from Built for Zero Community Solutions. We're having a CEOs and mayors event that's happening virtually. And uh, Mesa's mayor, Mayor Giles, is going to be um, kind of presenting and representing uh, Maricopa County on behalf of the veteran work that we're doing with Built for Zero. That's coming, it's gonna happen, um, I think January 13th or 15th, but um, if you're interested in, in attending that, please just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to have anyone attend that would like to. And that's all that I have, if there's anybody else. What did you say the date was, Tamara? It's either the 13th or the 15th, but I'll definitely, um, if you're interested, I'll send you an email. Thanks. Okay, if there's nothing else, um, this meeting is adjourned. That's all we had for today. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, everyone. Really good to see you. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.